Lord Jesus, we love you. Have your way with us this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all can be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. In this sanctuary, fantastic. This is just, love it. Reminds me, uh, well, this is a paintbrush, and this is an art studio, but it looks like a rainbow. And the remainder, it, it reminds us that God promised that he would never flood the world again. It, it, it also should, the rainbow should remind us of the reason why he flooded the world, which was sin. Amen? So, hallelujah. So last week, at the end of the second service, uh, I changed the verse we read at the end of the service. At the first service, we, we read Acts 1.8. But at the end of the second service, I asked the sound booth to change it, and we read, uh, oh, I'm drawing, drawing a blank. Thank you. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And I just did that out of the blue. But our Vacation Bible School does start tomorrow, and the key verse for Vacation Bible School is the next verse, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Coincidentally, I have three points in my message this morning, and they almost mimic that poster there, except I'm going to switch the created and design uh, a little bit. So if you need notes, there, there they are, right, right there. I have flown a whole bunch in my life. I've had some really, really long flights. I think the longest flight I ever took was, was from here to uh, Vietnam. Uh, that was long. Of course, there was a flight that uh, me and John Mays and Wayne Stewart and Don Doyle took uh, down to Argentina. Uh, that was uh, an exceptionally long flight. Here to Africa, that's a, a long flight. The first flight I ever took was actually from Seattle to London, flying on Pan Am Airlines. In a Boeing 747, which was relatively new at the time, in 1974, we flew the polar route, flew over the top of the North Pole. I've had some good flights, and I've had some really bad flights. When you hear the little ding and the seatbelt sign comes on, and the captain says, please return to your seats and fasten your seatbelts, we might have slight turbulence. And I'm thinking, slight? There's nothing slight at 25,000 feet and 500 miles an hour. Everything is serious. I remember once while landing another long flight from Kona, Hawaii to Pongo Pongo, America, Samoa. Um, that is a nine-hour flight, and the entire flight, every bit of it, is over water. There is nothing in the Pacific Ocean between Hawaii and Pongo Pongo. And as we were getting close to Pongo Pongo, and was, you know, shh, buckle up as we're going to turbulent. And there's lightning. And the lightning bolt cracks close to the plane. I thought I was going to die. And that when, you know, you, I tell people on my charter boat, you don't need to worry unless I look worried. Well, I looked at the stewardesses or the, the flight attendants or whatever, you, however you term it, and they're all buckled up white as ghosts. And I'm thinking, this is serious. But we landed. We landed just fine. Uh, and then the... the uh, captain or, or the head flight attendant says, if Pongo Pongo is your final destination, welcome home. And I wonder, well, how many people getting off this plane are just going to stay here and this is their new home? Getting, home and getting back on a plane after that. But, but hearing the word, if, if Pongo Pongo is your final destination, welcome home, I wonder what it's going to be like. Move closer now. When this life is over and we're standing before the Heavenly Father and he says, well done, good and faithful servant, welcome home. How, how exciting is that day going to be? But until then, until that day, we have an opportunity to live in a way that will make a kingdom impact. Someone said that a healthy church is not measured by the number of people who attend or the size of the building or the number of programs that are available or even how cool their VBS decorations are. A healthy church is measured, listen, measured by how many in the church are making a kingdom impact impact. So today's, today's message is based upon that VBS key verse, one of the New Testament's most notable teachings. The Apostle Paul says, for by grace you've been saved, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now most Christians have heard those verse, 
verses, but, but they don't always remember what he said next. He goes on to say, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So there's three things in this verse I want to sh share with you about making a, an impact for the kingdom of God. First, we are designed, switch those two, designed by God. For we are, it says, we are his workmanship. Now the word workmanship from the Greek language means something that is made. But it's not just like anything that was made. It's only used to indicate something that, that, that is a work of art. Some translations actually translate it that way and says, we are God's masterpiece. And in fact, this Greek word is also where we get the English word poem. I like that. Because God has written upon our hearts his law. That his word, with his word, therefore we are God's poem to the world. Makes you kind of look at, at, at a, a, oh, what's that, uh, when they, music that rhymes. Uh, rapping. Make, makes you think rapping all different now when we start talking about being God's poem. Uh, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works that my soul knows very well. Psalm 139, verse 14. Job tells us that it was the Lord's hands that made and shaped us. Your hands have made me and fashioned me in intricate unity. That's Job chapter 10, verse 8. And Job recognized is that God has uniquely made us all. We have been handcrafted, hand-designed by God. And that means that there is no one else that has it, the unique mix of gifts and talents that each of you have been given. In other words, each one of us has been uniquely crafted by God's hand. A one of a kind original design and that's true for everyone the Bible says that we have been fearfully and wonderfully made in the in the image and in the likeness of the Lord God himself and as such we are of huge value to God but listen we are not truly his masterpiece his artwork his poem until we come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ Paul's saying that being God's masterpiece begins at the time of salvation. For by grace you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, for we are his workmanship, listen, created in Christ Jesus. God has uniquely made each of us, handcrafted us for his purpose and his design, but his masterpiece, but, but to be his masterpiece, we have to take it to the next level. We have to ask Jesus to be our Savior and Lord. And when we do, then we will be that new work of art, that masterpiece of his design in Christ Jesus. To the church in Corinth, Paul put it this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, you know this verse, he's what? A new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The, the, this new work doesn't end there. Rather, God's just getting started, and he continues to mold us and shape us much like a potter with clay. That's why Jeremiah wrote this. Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. Jeremiah 18, verse 6. You and I are clay in God's hand, and it takes the entirety of our lives for God to mold us into this masterpiece that he has created you and I to be, into that poem for the entire world to read. Now, those potter wheels, anybody ever take pottery classes? If one of them's going too fast, the potter has a hard, hard time to create his masterpiece. The, the potter vessel will, will, will get out around and it's starting you know, like that, and then if it's going really fast, it actually flies off the wheel all, all together which is exactly how some of you are living right now. We have to learn how to slow down so God can shape and mold us into this perfectly formed creation rather than allow the world to mold us into its chaos. 
do not be conformed to, the, uh, to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God, Romans 12, verse 2. To be conformed, that's to allow outside pressure to shape us. But to be transformed means to be shaped from the inside out. Conforming is, is, is what the world does to us. Transforming is what the Lord does as he shapes us into the image and the likeness of his son, Jesus. And God does his best work with us when you and I slow down. When we take time to get into his word, when we take time to pray, when we take time to build relationships with those who call upon the name of the Lord with a pure heart, sometimes we just have to slow down and hear from God. Psalm 46.10 Be what? Still. And know that I am God. Sometimes we have to slow down so that we can, so that we can return to the potter's wheel. If you've been coming here a while, you've heard me tell stories about being up in my grandmother's house up in the mountains in northern Washington. Summers at my grandmother's house in the North Cascade Mountains on the Skagit River was an awesome part of my childhood and my early teen years. When I was 13, we had been living in Germany for two years, and we came back that summer, the summer of 1976. Um, I was allowed to spend a couple weeks up at Grandma's. And one of the reasons I enjoyed that so much is because my grandmother had purchased not one but two Yamaha Mini Enduro, Yamaha 80s. And I had full reign with these motorcycles. So I'm in tearing up. I mean, there's, I say neighborhood. There's only 100 people lived up there year-round. I mean, it's just working on the, the power uh, generators for Seattle City Light up there. Uh, but you know, all, all around in those motorcycles. Anyway, I had heard about a lake that was up in the mountains a couple miles or so, I'd been told, that was just loaded with trout. So I packed my backpack up, got my fishing rod, hopped on the bike, and I knew where the trailhead started. It was right there on the highway between Diablo Dam and Ross Dam. There's actually a sign that says trailhead, and there's a, um, a creek waterfall that comes down, a little bridge going over that waterfall, and that's where it started. So I hid my bike up in the woods so nobody driving by would see it, and I started heading up the, the hill. Well, I'm following a marked trail, but remember, I'm going to the lake. I'm not going where the trail goes. So I get up to a certain distance, a mile or two up there, and this is all uphill in the mountains, and I'm by myself, and I'm going to now leave the trail, and I'm going to make my way to this lake. So as I start making my way up here, I have a plan. I was not a Boy Scout, but I'd heard about them. So I was marking the trail. I was breaking branches. About every 20, 30 feet, I would break a branch, and you could look back, and you could see the tips of the branches broken, and I was marking my path. Well, finally, it was way further than I thought. Finally, I do make it to the lake. And I catch a ton of trout. It was great. But it took me so long to get there, it was time for me to go. So I start going back, and I'm following my trail markers. You know, here we go, broken branch, broken branch. And about 35, 40 minutes later, I run into a cliff that was not there when I came up. And then it dawned on me, listen, stay close, because this isn't just a story. This has a spiritual point. I was following the wrong trail. Somebody else has, was using the exact same broken branch system of marking trails that I was using. I wasn't sure what to do. So I found my way to a creek coming down the side of the mountain, and I was pretty sure that this was the one that actually goes to the highway where my motorbike is. So I'm having to follow the edge of the, I know that sounds easy because you're thinking flat. It's not flat, it's like this. And I have to follow the edge of this creek hoping it's the right one. And I'm hanging off cliffs and vines and skidding down stuff with a fishing rod and a backpack full of smelly trout. <laughs> and, and it's getting dark. And finally I get down there and lo and behold, I was right where I thought I was. I found, there's my motorcycle, I'm right at the, everything worked out. With the pressures of the world building up, pressures from our jobs, our family and friends, we start getting further and further away from our base of operation, from that trailhead. And we start looking at the world around us and, and what others are doing, and we find ourselves moving away from our trailhead that is away from God and away from his word. And we need to come back but we need to be very careful not to follow someone else's trail markers. 
We have to be careful not to follow the world's advice on what others say. We instead follow the true makers, the true markers, and that's the truth found in God's Word. I did a wedding yesterday evening, and I, I shared an illustration in that wedding that just seems appropriate here. Um, right in the middle of the wedding, I, I looked at the couple and I said, Monopoly. And they're all looking at me like, what, is he nuts? And I let them stay with me. I told them that I played Monopoly a certain way, raised in America. My wife played Monopoly a certain way, raised in Germany. This is not, this is a little embellished story, so it's not completely true. But the point is, and one of the contentions was uh, that luxury tax. You know that luxury tax spot on the Monopoly board? So where's that money go? See, where I was ra- when I was raised, in our house rules, what we did is we put that money in the middle. Well, other people apparently put it where the bank or where the jail is, and when you get out of jail free, you get that money. I'm like, that's not how you do or arguments. No, my house. This is what we learned. No, this is what. And then here's what we did. Listen, we, we went and we got the directions that were written by the person who created the game. Oh, you with me now? And then we opened up, and we know what we discovered. We're both wrong. The money goes in the bank. And here's the point. Each one of us have these false markers, these house rules that we learned growing up. It's wise to go to the manual written by the Creator to find out the real truth. Amen? Next time you hear the word monopoly, see, I told you your life was going to change today. So we are created, we are God's workmanship, we are His art piece, we are His masterpiece when we accept Christ but we were created to do good works. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Now here's the concept that I hope we all get here, and that is we have been created for a contribution. That's what God is saying to the prophet Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 1 verse 5, he says, Before I formed you in the womb, do we need to talk about the sanctity of human life, or is that enough? Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. That means that formed baby has a soul. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. That means set you apart for myself. And I ordained you a prophet to the nations. God's word to Jeremiah. And like Jeremiah, God has set each of us here on earth for a very special assignment, one that only you can do. And is all God wanted is for us to believe him. If all God wanted was for us to believe and become Christians, the moment you accepted Christ as Jesus as your Savior, he'd have taken you up to heaven. But he didn't. He left us here because he has something for us to do, a special assignment. He leaves us here to make a contribution in his kingdom. It isn't the, the duration of our lives that counts it's the donation of our lives that makes a difference it's what we add to life that makes a kingdom impact but no matter how much we talk about it how much we hear about it how much you know about it there's always a part within us that isn't sure with the hearing and the knowing there's a gap that exists between knowing listen stay with me between knowing you're supposed to do good work and experiencing the joy that comes when you actually do them. We can know where to make a difference in a contribution, and we can know that God has created us unique and has a special assignment for us, but unless we start serving, you will never know the amazing joy that awaits those who serve. One of my absolute favorite places in the entire earth is in Kima, Texas. It's called the Hoagie Ranch. I have been eating at the Hoagie Ranch. I tried to figure it out the other day. Not quite 20 years. I think like 17, 18 years, something along. The, and for the first seven or eight years, I ate the same thing every time. The John Wayne. Yes, yes. You know it. It is the Hoagie Ranch's version of a cheesesteak, but better. It, it, so I lived in New Jersey a couple of years. Cheese steak is without any vegetables on it. Cheese steak hoagie, that's when you get the, the lettuce and the tomato. But at the hoagie ranch, you get thinly sliced onions 
and the pepperoncinis on top and their special blend of spices and my mouth is watering. So that's all I ever ate. Why would I change? It was the best there is. But I, I my friend at the time, Leroy, he, he introduced me actually to the Hoagie Ranch. He would either get the Reuben or the pastrami. Stay with me. This story has a point. But you're all listening. See, this is. And he would tell me, he would tell me how good, uh, he'd say, you really got to try this. This is so good. And the sauerkraut, did you know that the marble rye is made in-house? It is, actually. They make the bread. There is. So finally, after seven or eight years, he only ate half a Reuben, and he said, why don't you try the other half? I did. When I, it was over. I knew that that ruin was going to be good. I'd heard about it. But until I experienced it myself, I ended up eating the ruin every day, every day for the next seven or eight years. It's true serving the Lord. We can know that he wants us to serve him by serving others. We can know all about the joy of fellowship, we can hear the messages from famous preachers and teachers of God's word, but until you and I actually do what the Lord created us to do, we'll never experience the joy that comes with it. Now, you may be saying, oh, what a great story, but you don't know what's going on in my life. <laughs> you know, I could never do it. I have, there's a, well, listen, stay with me. We're going to pray here in just a second, a unique prayer. We all have limiting factors, every one of us in this room that are holding us back from achieving what God has designed us to achieve. We all do. We all have reasons. Too young, too old, too short. Well, maybe that's mine. Not enough time. Don't feel qualified. Too busy, too much stuff, too much drama, too much TV or Internet. Sorry, didn't mean to hurt you. Or I was hurt, or I have an illness. We all, all of us, have that one thing. And I don't want to be insensitive but I remember what God said to the Apostle Paul when he wanted to be healed of his affliction so he could serve better. God said, my grace is sufficient for you, and my strength is made perfect in weakness. All of us have been given a wonderful gift and an opportunity to make an impact in God's kingdom. And what we have to do is to push through these barriers so we can move forward in a positive way. So what I'd like to do right now before I get to my third and final point is pray that God will take these objects that are holding us back and instead, let God use them. Maybe we need to approach this differently. Maybe we should listen to what God said. We need to look at them as God's grace to get us to that place where he can use us, where his strength is made perfect in our weakness. So before we go any further, let's just pray. Lord, we all have something that is holding us back from being everything that you've created us to be. So I'm asking, Lord, please take these limitations, take these hindrances, and in and by your grace, use them as you continue to mold us into the image of your son, Jesus. Amen. Now, oh, well, the timing's not right. You should have been here Wednesday. I talked about that. This is what Solomon wrote, Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 4. He says, He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who uh, regards the clouds will not reap. What he's saying is that if you're waiting for the right time to be used by God, you're going to be waiting forever. Because the right time is now, not later. And that brings us to the final point. Say amen. And how, did, how is it worded here? What's the last word here? Empowered. Empowered. Mine was take action. That's pretty close, right? We are God's masterpiece. Now's the time, now is the time to take action. Paul ends with these, three, these words, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So each of us is God's unique creation. God wants us to, to use us and his, this potential that he's created within us for his kingdom purposes. Becoming a Christian isn't just about knowing Christ. It's also about discovering our potential in Christ. That's why he's left you here. So serving and contributing is, is about what God created us to be for his purpose in order to further his kingdom. 
Jesus said, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom to many. That's Mark 10, verse 45. Jesus came to serve, not to be served. We, we see that as a great example that he gave us. It, it's a picture of a servant. Je Jesus took up a towel and washed the disciples' feet which was the lowest form of serving in that day. God is waiting for us to make a kingdom impact, not by ruling over others, but by serving them as he served. Amen? This is an amazing adventure we're on. Can, I mean, I know it's been stressful, but look what we have gone through. I mean, it's, it's amazing. You're in a church that's been burnt down and flooded and... and uh, quarantined and all, all of that. It, it, what an amazing adventure on. It's amazing. It, it's where God can take people like you and me and shape us into vessels of honor to be mightily used for his kingdom through the stuff that we go through. We can contribute as we've always, uh, as we've always continued or, or say it isn't time yet or I've done my duty. It's someone else's turn. I have looked in the Bible. I can't find that. But by doing or, or saying these things, we'll never truly reach our fullest potential, that masterpiece that God has created you to be in Christ Jesus. If we continue to live as we always have, the church is not going to reach its fullest potential. It'll be fun and amazing, but we won't get to the spot God wants us to be at. Everything God desires for us to be, because God's word says that we are all members of one body, that means for me to get where God wants me to be, you've got to get where God wants you to be. We're in this together. We're one body. So the hand cannot say to the foot, I don't need you. Not if it wants to be what God created it to be. Could you imagine what Seabrook would look like? What this community would look like if our church was always working in harmony all the time with all the gifts and talents that, that have been given to us by God. I mean, 12 people changed the world. What could 200 do to Seabrook? Isn't that an awesome thought? So let's get back. I'm almost done. Let's get back to the potter's wheel. Back to God's word. Back to prayer. And be the kingdom difference makers that God has created us to be. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he had prepared for us beforehand that we might walk in them. Amen? Are you ready to pray? Father, I'm so excited about Vacation Bible School, about the 113 registered kids that we have coming, about every adult volunteer and youth volunteer, every family that's going to pull up in front of this church. And, and open the doors as their kids run out. But Father, truly our prayer for them is that they all come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. That they would know that they are created by God for good works in Christ Jesus. And Father, I pray for our church that we wouldn't let our circumstance hinder our service. That we would find ways to, con to continue to serve others that we might be exactly what you have purposed us to be. Thank you for the gifts, the talents the, that you have uniquely placed in this building at this moment. Thank you, Father. As we do every time the church prays, Lord, we pray for revival in our nation. Father, we pray for the reclamation of the rainbow. For the purpose that God actually had in those things. Father, we pray for peace in the Ukraine and for the families who've lost lives. And we pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Just a few announcements today. Uh, obviously, the only thing going on next week is Vacation Bible School. Um, you are all invited to come by and see what God is doing in the building, uh, in all the buildings and the, and the outside and the playground, all that during the week. Uh, don't hesitate. It's pretty cool to see um, how our church handles 100 plus kids uh, five days for, what, eight hours a day? So that's going to be like 5,000 snacks and this is crazy. Uh, so no Wednesday service, but please be praying for the church 
Um, the next, uh, next week our schedule will return to its normal schedule. Uh, any other announcements that need to be made? Luke. Ooh, praise team recruitment time. Anybody else? Ashley, do you have anything for us? Clear out all the tears. All right. Uh, birthdays. Let's see. Now, I know Joey had a birthday this week, just yesterday. And Karen had a birthday yesterday? Friday. Are there any other birthdays? Then Joey and Karen, this is just for you. Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Let's all stand together and read from the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. <coughs> Here we go, all together. Memorize this verse this week, because the kids are going to. And if they can, you can, right? Here we go. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Go with God, everyone. Have a great week.